All right, we're getting ready for our summative number five in Algebra 2. And this first section is going to be our third attempt at advanced factoring. So remember, you're going to use your flowchart and a few specific types of questions that you're going to see on your test tomorrow. So the first part of the flowchart says to look for a common factor. There's no common factor in this first question. So we're going to have to dive into one of our factoring patterns. And this is the difference of cubes. So what I would love to see on your paper when you test this is literally write down or an abbreviation even of difference of cubes and then I would like you to write down the formula that you're going to plug into. So the formula for difference of cubes, the factoring side of it, is a minus b and then times a squared uh, plus a times b plus b squared. And the catch is you have to figure out who a and b are. So you're going to take the cube root of each term and that's going to figure out your a and your b. So remember on your calculator, um, the cube root button is in the math menu. Um, so you can go down to math, over to math, and then I think it's down to number four. And that's where you find the cube root. Otherwise, you can count on your chart. So the cube root of 216 is six, but remember there's an a to the third there as well. So make sure you're taking all of that. So, oh, that's kind of confusing because it's an a already, but 6a. And then for b, the cube root of 125 is five. You don't have to worry about signs because they're already built into your formula here. So when I go to plug in those that a and that b into this formula, we write down 6a minus 5. And then 6a squared is like 6a times another 6a. So that's 36a squared. Make sure you're multiplying the 6 twice as well. And then plus a times b, which will be 30a. and then plus b squared five times five, better known as 25. I like the cubic patterns. Once you figure out how easy they are to use, I think you'll end up liking them too, hopefully. So this is the step that a lot of people forgot to do on the last test, is they forgot to cube root each of the terms before they plugged them into the pattern, essentially. And then this term right here, remembering that it's six times another six. So um, instead of thinking it as first term squared, think of it as first term times itself. You're going to use a similar pattern in number two. Let's go ahead and work through number three together. So this time, instead of the difference, you have the sum. So you're going to use the sum of cubes. So the first thing I'm going to write down on my paper is the pattern, the factoring pattern. So it factors into a plus b, and then times a squared minus a times b plus b squared. So same idea. You need to cube root each of the terms before you can figure out who a and b are. So over here, I'm going to write down a and b. All right, so the cube root of 27x to the third would be a 3 and an x. Please don't lose the variable. And then the cube root of 8 is a 2. So now that you know who a and b are, now you can plug them into that formula. So a plus b would be 3x plus 2. And then a times a would be 3x times 3x, so that's 9x squared. Now it's minus a times b, so 3x times 2 is 6x. And then plus b squared, which would be 2 times 2, which is 4. There we go. So, not too bad if you could start using that pattern properly. I think you guys will get through it. Please let this be the last time we have to test that pattern. All right, so we're still not out of that section. Back to the top of the flowchart, look for any common factors. Well, this one definitely has a common factor. So what I want to see from you is I want you to first identify who the common factor is, remembering that it can be a number, it could be a variable, it could be both. So in this case, the common factor that we're going to take out of every term is an n. Everybody has at least an n. So I'm going to show the division underneath each term, but that common factor of n doesn't go anywhere. It's just going to stay in front of the problem. So this leaves you with n squared, and then minus 15 times n when you cancel one of them, and then a plus 50, because the n's will cancel in the last term. Now you got to keep going. This is a two-stepper. So that n that you factored out stays in front, and then you're going to factor reverse foil kind of factoring this trinomial. Um, what times what gives you n squared? Well, that's n and n. 
and then something times something gives you 50, but you need your arches to add up to negative 15, so keep that in mind. So what if we did a negative 10 and a negative 5? That would be your final answer, your complete factorization um, of this expression. So this one's going to take two steps, as will the one next to it. So make sure you make a little note to self. This one takes two steps. It's okay. It happens. All right, next one, four terms. There's no common factor throughout the entire question, so we're going to dive right into factor by grouping. So you group your first term, and you factor out a common term, and you do the same thing with the second terms, or last two terms, I should say. All right, first group. Common factor, oh boy, 30 and 12 can both be divided by a 6, and they both have an x squared. So let's factor out a 6x squared from each of those. And that comes out in front of your group. And let's look at what's left over. So this first group, this 30 divided by 6 is a 5, and there's still an x left. And then over here, um, in the end of the group, you have a minus 2. So now when I look at what I'm going to factor out of the second group, knowing that I need my parentheses to match the 5x minus 2, looks like we need to factor out a negative 5. And let's see what's left when we factor out the negative 5. Better be 5x minus 2. All right, so right here we have 5x and then a minus 2. Awesome. So in order for factoring by grouping to work, you need these parentheses to match, which they do. So I'm going to factor that out in front of my problem now. And then I look at what's left over. So you still have a 6x squared, and you still have a minus 5 as a term. That is your final answer for factoring by grouping. Last time we tested this, some of you forgot to keep going. You, like, you got to this step, but you didn't factor that common term out. All right, I'm going to leave number 8 for you to do. And then this question is going to take a little writing on your part. So I want to know who here can be factored more. So when I look at this question, a lot of kids see the 16 and they get excited. Um, but for the squares pattern to work, it has to be the difference of squares. So it actually turns out that number 9 and number 12 cannot be factored more. Um, and the reason is the sum of squares is not a thing. So I'm going to write a little explanation of you can't factor the sum of squares. So how does that leave us for number 10 and number 11? So those are the difference of squares, which is totally a pattern. Oops, that says squares. <laughs> uh, and the pattern for the difference of squares, remember, is where you square root each of them, and then one's a plus and one's a minus, the good twin, the evil twin pattern. So this guy is going to factor into, okay, if I square rooted, I'm running out of room here, if I square rooted each of these terms, you'd be left with, what do we have, x and x, and then a 4y and a 4y, so plus 4y and a minus 4y. That was kind of an unusual factoring question, right? But the same idea is going to happen here for number 11. All right. Rewriting. So remember, we have some formulas, some transformational formulas. So we started with a logarithm, and then it has a, I always use blue for this, a little base b. And then inside of the logarithm is some number, and it equals an answer, which I use red for that. So that's logarithmic form. What if we wanted to transform it into exponential form? So it's got that same base, blue base, but then this a becomes his exponent. And then whatever was in the logarithm is now going to be the answer to the, that question. So a little color coding on, on your part will probably help this question. We have a 19 as our base, so 19 is still the base. The 2 is that red answer. It becomes the exponent. And then the 361 is inside the logarithm. So that becomes my answer over here. So all they want you to do is go from logarithmic form to exponential form on that first question. So I'll leave 14 for you to do. Um, but let's take a look at 15. This one is going the opposite direction. So they give you exponential. So apparently x is your base. So when I go to write it as a logarithm, it's logarithm base x. And then our answer of y is what is actually in the logarithm. And then this exponent originally was the answer to this question. I don't know why. I really have a hard time figuring out 
that version of the formula going from exponential to log. I guess my brain just doesn't like it. So these are opposite problems from each other. Um, I think using colors would be brilliant. You know me and my use of, use of colors. All right, so these questions are evaluating. So these are the thinker questions. So what power is going to make this happen? So you're going to rewrite it into the brain-friendly notation of 2 to what mystery power is going to give you an 8. And you want to maybe use your chart for a check on the calculator. Um, and you think, 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 and eventually you stumble upon 3. The answer is 3. 2 to the third power is 8. So same idea here. We have base 2 again. Raised some mystery power. Don't know it. And it's supposed to equal... It's in the logarithm, which this time is a fraction, 1 over 16. So, again, chart might help you, but then you also have to understand something about exponents. In order to change a 2 to a fraction, you're going to have to have a negative exponent. So, now my job is to figure out, okay, well, what would change a 2 to a 16? What power? And that would be to the 4th power. So we're going to have to use a negative and a 4 in the exponent in order to make a 2 change to a 1 over 16. So when you check that on your calculator, if you type 2 to the negative 4th power, then you're going to hit math enter enter, and it should pop back to a 1 over 16. All right, this next one's kind of boring. It's the same idea, right? So it's like 3 to what power equals a 9? Think, think, think. A lot of kids tell me the answer to this is 3. That's not right. Uh, the answer is 2. 3 to the second power is 9. So watch out that you're doing powers and not multiplying. Um, let's look at 20 real quick, just in case I don't get a chance to do this one in class. What power would you have to raise a number to to get a 1? Well, that's actually an exponent property. The only power that makes that happen is the power of 0. So that's just the 0 power property. All right. Move it along here. Lots of highlighter work going on. Um, first thing I want you to remember is logarithms are weird on your calculator, and even the function itself is weird. So there's a built in negative right here. It really says x minus a negative 3. Some of you just think of that as opposites, and that's okay. But that's what I'm going to highlight. So this negative 3 shift um, to the left. Let's so that's one of the questions they're going to ask you um, on the test, is what are the transformations? So it's been shifted left 3, and that has to do with the opposite thing, the built-in negative, whatever you want to think about. It is also the location for the asymptote. So this left 3 shift, this negative 3, is going to be the location of our vertical asymptote this time, which is very hard to see on the calculator because your calculator does a bad job. But I want to see a highlighter mark on your paper. So the vertical asymptote is at x equals negative 3. Again, another place for the highlighter to be used. So now when you go to graph it um, on your table, your calculator is not going to give you a whole lot of good stuff. So like for instance, at negative 4 and at negative 3 before it, um, you're going to see errors. So like these, this spot right here, everything after it, for it, if you want to think of it that way, are going to give you errors because it's beyond the asymptote line. But, um, let's see, if we plug in a negative 2, you get 1, <laughs> I'm sorry, 0, hello. And then there's not really going to be a lot of good points here. If you kind of look forward in the chart, um, I don't know why I made that dashed. <laughs> uh, this is supposed to be dashed. So keep going down the chart, and you're going to see, let's see, 7? Yeah, 7 is finally going to be the next good ordered pair at 7, 1. So negative 2, 0, and 7, 1. Wah, wah. So when you look at your calculator, it's going to look like this. Oh, man, that was really good. All right, if this is what you draw, you are not going to get a good score on this question because you have to know that the vertical asymptote just kind of swoops down and slides along the vertical asymptote over there. So two more questions, domain and range. The range should be the easy question for you guys on this test. So the range this time goes up and down forever, negative infinity to infinity. 
but the domain is going to be restricted by that asymptote. So negative 3 to infinity. Notice I used a parenthesis because of the asymptote. It doesn't actually get there. And this is the final time where I want you to use your highlighter on that question. So notice, negative 3, left 3, negative 3, negative 3. They all match. The line on the graph is at negative 3. I really love when you guys use the highlighters on this question. It helps me. All right, transformations. We're talking right or left, up or down. So when I look at 25 and 27, remembering that there's a built-in negative right here, that really means left 4. Um, why did I use red? I usually use green there. All right, so right here means left 4. And then this number right here is exactly what you think it would be. That's a down 1. You can try graphing them on your calculator to verify. It's just a little hard to see what's going on on your calculator for logarithms. All right, so here... X minus 1 really means right 1, built in negative. And then this plus 3 is up 3. All right, we'll leave the evens for you. Properties of logarithms. So remember, we have some properties of logarithms. Um, I'm going to back up one, insert a slide, and remind ourselves about these properties. So you've got, I'm going to leave the base off of the logarithm just for like easiness here. Um, but if you have the logarithm, and inside of the logarithm you have a multiplication question, you can expand that to the log of the first thing plus the log of the second thing. And that works for two, three, four, five, doesn't matter how many things, they all get broken up with addition. Now there's another property that says if you have a division problem inside of your logarithm, that can be expanded to the log of the first thing minus the log of the second thing, or the denominator. So then there's one more property. This is the one we refer to as the Mario property in class. If you have a logarithm, and inside that logarithm, you've got something raised to an exponent. This, this exponent can really get rewritten, it gets pulled down in front of the logarithm as a coefficient. So it's really a times the log of x. So those are the three properties that we're going to be using, but sometimes there's more than one property going on. And notice these are double directional arrows, meaning you can go from this version of it to the condensed version, and I'm going to ask you to do both on your test. So here we're expanding, so you're going this direction on those properties. I notice we have multiplication questions going on, so we're going to split that up into log plus log plus log, and this time we have a natural log. So the natural log of x plus the natural log of y plus the natural log of z squared. I have to put z with a slash so it doesn't look like a 2. But we're not done because now we're going to use that exponent property, that Mario property that says this exponent gets written down in front. So final answer is the natural log of x plus the natural log of y plus 2 times the natural log of z. Um, if you can do that in one step, that just makes you really awesome. Um, I don't encourage you to do all your math in your head on a test ever, but you know, sometimes it you can see it, and that's awesome. Um, you also don't need to use these parentheses. I just like that you guys understand that these things are inside of the logarithm function. The notation gets a little crazy, doesn't it? All right, this next one, 31. We have the natural logarithm again. Um, this time we have a division question. So we're trying to expand it. So again, you're going this direction on the property. So we have the natural log of the numerator minus the natural log of the denominator. So we've got u to the fifth minus natural log of v to the sixth. But wait, there's more. Because using that power property, this exponent's going to come down in front of his logarithm, and so is this exponent, but only in front of their logarithms, right? So you have 5 times the natural log of u minus 6 times the natural log of v. That is the fully expanded answer. Remember, there's a little checklist 
you know, everything should only have one, every logarithm should only have one thing inside of it, and there should not be any exponents left. So that's how you know you're done expanding. So now we're going to reverse all that, and we're going to condense. So if someone did expand it, we're going to go backwards. So all those properties we saw, we're going to go this direction on them. And if you think about the last thing you typically did in those expanding questions was bring the exponent down. So that's going to be the first thing you're going to look for in these questions usually is to bring the exponent back up. So this 12 and this 4 are going to go back up to their logarithms exponent. So this is the natural log of, it's u to the 12th power, plus natural log of v to the 4th power. And here's how you know when you're done condensing. You should just have a single logarithm when you're all done. Okay? So we're not done because we still have log plus log. So when you have log plus log and you go to condense them, um, that means you're going to multiply the stuff inside together. Now there's not really a lot of algebra happening here, guys. If you multiply u to the 12th times v to the 4th, you just get u to the 12th times v to the 4th. So there's really no simplifying to do there. Any order, of course, community's property and all. So this is how you know you're done when you're condensing. You'll have logarithm and then a bunch of stuff inside of it. So the next one, um, ooh, we have one exponent, sneaky. So throw that guy back up. So you've got this time the common log of A plus the common log of B plus the common log of, and then it's C, but remember we brought the exponent up, so it's C to the fifth power. So again, you're not done until you're a single logarithm. I think you guys are good enough to just condense down to a single logarithm right now. All those logarithms are being added together, so you're going to end up multiplying them all together. So inside of a single logarithm, you're going to have a times b times c to the fifth. If you would like to put like multiplication dots in between them, you can. Why does that a look so weird? Try that again. a times b times c to the fifth. That's a great answer. We know we're done because it's a single logarithm. All right. Um, I feel like we should look at number 36. So this time, you've got an exponent here. And you've got an exponent here. So we have the natural log of u to the third. I should have wrote smaller plus the natural log of b, and then minus the natural log of v to the sixth. Now, plus, plus, minus. You should technically do this one in two steps. So we're going to start by condensing the log plus log. When you condense the log plus log, that means you're going to multiply these things together. So this is u to the third times b, which is just u to the third times b. But remember, you still have this minus the natural log of v to the sixth. So when you condense log minus log, remember that becomes a, um, division, a division question, or a quotient. So let me get this thing out of the way. Oh, back up. This guy, get out of the way. So single logarithm, we're ready to finish the question. Just remember that it's the first logarithm is your numerator, and you're dividing by what's in the second logarithm. So again, I reiterate, I know some of you guys are really wonderful at these, and you can see the collapsing and the condensing without showing all the steps. That's really awesome, and in practice, and in you know times when you want to go really fast, that's a great tool. I just don't think it's a great thing to do on a test when like silly mistakes are going to really catch your score. Um, so work through these slowly. We're going to move on in the next section to solving logarithmic equations. So we're going to have to be like really well versed on how logs work and behave and what we can do to manipulate them. Um, so hopefully this test goes well and we can move on. All right, good luck.